When you get your Bible, guys, turn it to Romans chapter 15 as we continue our study in Romans. You know, last week, as we studied the first 13 verses, if you were here last week, of chapter 15, Paul continued his thoughts, guys, of chapter 14. He was continuing those thoughts of receiving of receiving the brethren in, those in the brother. He told us in, in 14, he says, don't dispute over these little differences in your faith. Don't dispute over those things as long as you got the same Jesus, right? As long as you're standing on the gospel, not judging any on their faith and those little things. And for the Jew and the Gentile, it was pretty huge. That Jew was, you know, he wouldn't eat that meat unless he knew it was absolutely kosher. That Gentile, he'd chow down on that, you know, roadkill out there. Didn't really matter, right? He said, don't let that separate you. He said, also, last week, he said, help those that were weak, the weak ones. I love that part, church. I really do. Let the stronger ones strengthen the weaker. Those who are stronger in their faith. Those who have a... a what I want to say, maturity, more maturity in their faith. Let them help those, those uh, weaker ones. It said there in verse 1 of chapter 15, we then who are strong, he included himself, I think Paul could include himself, we then who are strong ought to bear with the scruples of the weak. That basically means the weaknesses of the weak. Uh, and not to... Pl uh, the, weak, the scruples of the weak and not to please ourselves. What he's telling is, hey, we need to build them up. Help them make their faith unshakable, church. You understand that? You need to help those make their faith unshakable. Shore up their faith. I mentioned last week about like a bridge. You got a rickety old bridge. I was a contractor for years. There's times I had to shore up a house because little things you know, an old home and shore it up and jack it up and get it solid. You're doing the same thing with their faith. Let your strong faith be an example to the weaker. That's what Paul is really telling those believers. Let your stronger faith be an example to those who are weaker. You know, when we think about faith, I want to say we can speak of it in several ways. Now, what is faith? All right? What is our faith? Well, I think faith could be one definition. You could say confidence or trust. You know, we can have confidence or trust, and that's, that's our faith in that. It can be belief and a reality, belief in the unseen. Oh, man, you said that, Pastor, belief in what we haven't seen. Yeah, I don't know anybody here seeing God. Anybody here see Jesus? I haven't. Not even on that piece of toast did I see him, you know? Ah, man, you guys got to cheer up in here. Belief in the unseen. Hope even in an unknown fact. That could be faith. In Hebrews, the writer of Hebrews says it very well. He says in Hebrews 11, 1, Now faith is a substance of things hoped for. Hope for the evidence of things not seen. It's actually the evidence of things not seen. You know, the Christian faith or really any faith is based on that. You guys understand that? I don't know what your faith is. If your faith is in evolution, you know, it's based on something you can't see. But if our faith is in God as creator, it's still based on those things. Same. Now, faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. So how are we to strengthen others in faith? Can't show you it, right? Can't show you God. Can't show you Jesus. How are we to strengthen them? How are we to build up their confidence, even their trust, in something unseen? How do we help others get that stronger faith? That's a good question. I personally only know one way. Your testimony. My testimony. What God has already done. What He's done in your life. Your testimony. What God has shown you. Personally, I can only show Jesus... Really, I mean, the, the physical Jesus by my own life and what Christ has done in my life. You know, this may be odd, okay? I'm going to say something. It may sound a little odd. I've always thought of my faith in two, in two areas, church. It was in that trust and it was in that belief. Does God exist? All right, that belief there, does God exist? And then can I trust God now? And so really your faith should, those kind of come together. But for me, I always split them apart. Number one was my belief in God's existence. Is he true? Is it real? Is all this real, right? 
And then my trust in the ability of God to keep his word to me and his promises to me. To do what he says he will do. Trusting my life, basically, in his hands. I got to tell you, my, my belief in God, actual existence, the existence of God. This was long before I could even think about the trust in it was tested very early in my Christian walk. Uh, I've shared my testimony with you guys. and I come from a pretty miry pit, man, 25 years ago. And when God met me, I was sure, man, this is God. This is God. He met me. Started attending church. I'm listening to the word taught just like you guys are, you know. Listening to the word taught. And all of a sudden, this doubt comes in. This doubt comes in my head. Is this real? Is God really real? Well, backing this up a little bit, just before that came to me, my daughter Leah. My daughter Leah at that time was probably eight, nine years old. And Leah was always a very, very bubbly child. By the way, that's the mother of my new granddaughter. Okay? And so Leah was always a bubbly child. But she had gone into the, almost this depression. And here's what it was. Our son... My wife and our son died at three and a half years old before Leah was born. And so she always asked this question. She was asking us this question to me, to my wife. Do you think Jimmy would love me? And she would ask this question. Do you think Jimmy would love me? And we'd say, well, of course he'd love you. Because she never met her brother, right? She wasn't born yet. We had his picture up on the, on the uh, entertainment center, always do. And still today we have it in our kitchen. And so she would ask me this question. She'd ask Diane that question. You think Jimmy loved you? And we said, yeah, absolutely. So while this is happening with her, my doubt's hitting me. Is God real? Is my God even real? So one morning, Leah wakes up and comes out to my wife. She's at the, the dining room table, and she's got a big glow about her. I mean, she's literally alone. This was, the, she's been in this funk for a while, you know, she's been down for a while. She comes out with this glow, and Diane asks her, she says, well, good morning, Leah. How'd you sleep? And she says, really, really good. She says, I, I had a dream. I had a dream, but she says it was real. Now, you guys got to bear with me on this. If I start crying, don't laugh at me, okay? She says it, it was real, and Diane asks her, she says, well, what was it? She says, well, Jimmy came to me. Jimmy came to me. And she asked her, she says, well, what did he look like? And she said, it looked like his picture, but he had a, something wrapped around his waist, and he was carrying a stuffed elephant. Now, Leah never knew when we had Jimmy cremated that we put his favorite stuffed elephant and his blanket around his waist. <laughs> Here's the hard part. <laughs> so then my wife asked her, she says, well, did he say anything to you? She said, yes. He said, I love you. Guys, my faith has never shaken since in the existence of God. Through that, through that time, God used that. You can, you know, take it for what you want. God used that. He killed two birds with one stone. He brought my daughter out of that, out of that depression. She was happy and joyful. Her brother loved her. And I knew God existed. Amen? Amen. My trust in God, though. My trust in God for his promises, has been built over years of him keeping those promises, church. I hope that's for you too. God keeping those. My testimony. My witness of what God has done in my life. That's my trust in God. And I'll be honest with you, I've come to the point now because, man, he's brought me down a road in some crazy places and some, dirt, and, and some tricky times, you know, from one end to the other. From you know, loss of family members to financial situations to everything. And now I think my trust in God is nearly unshakable too. Right? So Paul's been encouraging the church to receive others and build them up in their faith. In their own testimony, church. Show each one. Show each one. Receive. 
receive the God of hope is what he said. In verse 13, as we ended last week, it says, Now may the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace in believing that you may abound in hope by the power of the Holy Spirit. Receive them, he said. Show them, strengthen them. Show them the joy and peace you have. You understand the Christian walk needs to be that. Yeah, I realize you guys got some trials from time to time. Get over it. You got eternal life for crying out loud. What more do you want, right? What more do you want? You got a God that loves you so much. Show them the joy and peace. Show them God's Holy Spirit living in you. Amen? Let's pray. And we're going to get into this morning's message. Boy, that was a long interlude. Father God, we just thank you, God. I thank you for your word. I thank you, Lord, for what you're done in my life and what I see you doing in the life of others, God. Are you real? You bet you're real, God. You're as real as they come. And Jesus, you work in us. God, you give us the power of your spirit within us. We just thank you and praise you. In Jesus' name, amen. Mm. So my message uh, title this morning is Gospel on the Move. Guys, the gospel was on the move back then. You know, really for several thousand years, the gospel's been on the move. But it needs to be on a bigger move, I believe. Paul will now speak. He's going to talk about the confidence he has in his brethren. As we go into verse 14, he's going to speak of this confidence. you got to understand, Apostle Paul sent this letter out by a carrier. He wrote this letter from Corinth. And he sent it out because he wasn't able to get to Rome yet. Now, many people thought, oh, that Paul, he's scared to go to the big city of Rome, right? He's going to go hang out in these little villages out here where, where he's safe. He wasn't scared to go there. He had received news back of the church. You know, there were people, there was communication, but he hadn't been there yet. But he, so he had this confidence that was really cool. I love it. He says there in verse 14, Now I myself, being Paul, am confident concerning you, my brethren, you up there in, in Rome, the church, that you also are full of goodness, filled with all knowledge, Able to admonish one another. What's admonish? Teach one another. Pretty much. Simply teach one another. I love the fact that Paul was confident, guys, of his, excuse me, of his Christians, these Christians in Rome, his Christian brothers and sisters. He was confident. They were full of goodness, he said. You guys are doing a good job up there. You're taking care of the widows. You're feeding the hungry. You're going into the prison and visiting the prisoners. You're doing this goodness, right? You're full of goodness. You're filled with knowledge. You're listening. You're receiving this letter. Obviously, we're from verse chapter 1 to chapter 15. There was a lot of knowledge he put on them. You're full of this knowledge, too. You're listening to the Spirit. You're able to admonish or teach others. That was huge. You understand that? Those three things, guys, being those goodness, the goodness in a church, I want to say, the knowledge in the church, and being able in that church to teach others, those three things is one sign of a healthy church. I got to tell you, those are the sign of a healthy, healthy church when that is taking place. You know, a church that will grow not, uh, not only in numbers, you know what I mean? But it'll grow spiritually. That's a healthy church. A healthy church is a church that is growing spiritually, has nothing to do with the numbers, nothing at all. One of my greatest pleasures, and I mentioned this, I think, last Wednesday night, is seeing spiritual growth right here, is watching the spiritual growth, and I'm seeing it. I'm seeing those grow spiritually. Well, some of them might be grown this way, too. After that potluck, we might be grown this way. <laughs> But they're growing spiritually, and, and it, it blesses me. And, you know, I grow more spiritually, too. You understand that? It's not like I've reached some pinnacle by any means. But I get to grow as God, as I teach God's Word and I watch you guys grow. God gives us each wisdom. Like I say, it's one of my greatest pleasures. Like I say, the, the, the numbers, the numbers make no difference. You're sound. You become sound doctrinally and spiritually. That's the important part. Guys, there are far too many super large churches that are spiritually are weak. Do you understand that? Too many 
Huge, huge churches that are spiritually are weak and small. They lack essential knowledge. The Word of God is not really being taught. There is a stadium in Texas with a smiling preacher that fills that place with 30,000 plus people every Sunday. I don't have to mention Joel Olstein's name. I have watched him over and over. I have never heard him preach the gospel, guys. Never. Never has he preached the gospel. He's told you how good you are. He's told you how much God loves you. Praise the Lord. I'm glad. I'm God, g- glad God loves you, and I'm glad he loves me. But you need to preach the gospel. You need to teach them. They're filled with those places. There's so many that are weak. They lack the characteristics of Jesus' church. Guys, they lack readiness for the day. Turn your Bibles into 2 Peter chapter 3, if you would, please. Uh, friendly seeking, friendly seeker churches. Is that what they call them? Seeker friendly. I'm sorry, seeker the other way around. Seeker friendly churches. I feel good when I'm there. Second Peter chapter three, verse ten. Peter writes, says, "But the day of the Lord, guys, the church needs to be ready for this. I don't care if 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 it's going to be in your lifetime or not." God calls us to be ready. But the day of the Lord will come like a thief in the night in which the heavens will pass away and the great noise and the elements will melt with fervent heat. Both the earth and the works of, and the works that are in it will be burned up. I talked about that earlier, about creation. Therefore, since all these things will be dissolved, what manner of person ought you to be in holy conduct and godliness? As Peter writes here, who are we to be? All these things are going to take place. Looking for and hastening the coming day of the God, because of which the heavens will be dissolved, being on fire, and the elements will melt with fervent heat. Nevertheless, we, according to His promise, look for those new heavens and new earth, I spoke of that, with righteousness, uh, in which righteousness dwells. Therefore, beloved, therefore, remember what I told you about therefore? Everything he just spoke, right? Therefore, beloved, looking forward to these things, be diligent. Man, I love that word. My pastor Dan used to tell me all the time, son, be diligent. To be found by him in peace without spot and blameless. That's Christian character right there, church. And consider that the long suffering of our Lord is salvation as also our our beloved brother Paul, according to the wisdom given to him has written to you. You don't think God could come tomorrow? You don't think God could have ended this a long time ago? Boy, we have a long-suffering, loving God. Amen? One long-suffering God. It is salvation, that long-suffering, he says. He says, uh, is given to you, as also in all the epistles, speaking in them things which are some things hard to understand. Yes, some are. Which untaught and unstable people, though they twist in their own destruction, as they do also the rest of the scriptures. Spoke about that last week, how they'll take things out of context. You therefore, beloved, since you know this beforehand, beware, lest you also fall from your own steadfastness, being led away with the error of the wicked. But then he says, The final exhortation, but grow, grow in the grace and the knowledge of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. To him be the glory both now and forever. Grow, grow in the grace and the knowledge, church. How do you get that knowledge? Well, you study. I don't know any other way to get knowledge. If you're looking for it, just to fall down out of the heavens on you, you know. God can give you great wisdom, but that knowledge is normally through studying. Attending a a, a Bible study, studying in Bible study, studying on your own. Get you a nice little uh, devotional. Have a little time of study. Spend that time in God's Word every day. Amen? Grow in the grace and knowledge. You know, I look at it this way. If you're not growing, you're stagnant. Two years ago, where we used to grow our garden up there, something happened to that dirt, and I know what it was. It was these cypress tree roots came in there, right? So I I had tilled it up and everything, and I planted a garden, and I literally planted a zucchini plant, not from seed. I planted it. It was about this big. That thing didn't grow. It was stagnant, man. 
It had stagnant ground. It didn't grow a bit. It blossomed several times. Not one zucchini on this thing. Needless to say, I gave up on that piece of ground right there. But anyway, if you're not growing, you're stagnant. You can become dead, I guess. You know, dead in your faith. If you're not moving forward, you're really sliding backwards in reality. You need to be moving forward. Verse 15, we got to move on. Nevertheless, brethren, he says, I have written more boldly to you on some points as reminding you because of the grace given to me by God. I love Paul's, you know, Paul there. That's the apostle Paul wrote, you know, 80 some percent of the New Testament. He says, I'm doing this because God's given me grace. I tell you, I look at the grace God has given me personally. I look at the grace God's given you. It brings humility, really. That I might be a minister, he says, that God's given me this grace, that I might be a minister of Jesus Christ to the Gentiles, ministering the gospel of God, that the offering of the Gentiles might be acceptable and sanctified now by whom? The Holy Spirit. So Apostle Paul, he always knew his calling, guys, and his calling was to the Gentiles. Yeah, did he speak to the Jew? Did he try to evangelize the Jew also? Absolutely. But he knew his calling, and that was to the Gentiles. Paul was an apostle to the Gentiles by the command of Jesus. He never doubted that calling. From the time it was given to him, if you guys remember, we studied the book of Acts. We were over a year in the book of Acts. And if you were way back there during the road to Damascus, where Jesus met Saul at that time, knocked him to the ground and introduced himself. Paul got up and said, hey, Lord, (laughs) you know, I love that part. Hey, Lord, I know who you are. You're God. In Acts 9, 15, but the Lord said to him, go, for he is a chosen vessel of mine to bear my name before the Gentiles. That was his main calling, those Gentiles, also the kings and the children of Israel, the Jews. But his main was the was the Gentiles. But see, Paul's calling for the Gentiles, guys, you got to understand it became more than just preaching the gospel. It was more than just evangelizing a Gentile, right? It literally was one of ministering to those Gentiles. And what do I mean by that? Teaching them. Teaching them godly living. Instructing believers how to live before God. Right? The Jewish believer was a great step ahead of the Gentile believer in this area. The Jewish believer had been, well, they've known their God for thousands of years, right? Right? The Jews, they had been doing this for years, but the Gentile never had. The Gentile didn't know anything about worshiping God, who this God was. So he had to literally minister to him and teach him. He was clueless, basically. That Gentile was clueless to godly living. All the Gentile knew when he got saved, man, something's changed. Something's changed. You you ever have that experience? I know I did. When God came into my life, it was like, whoa, something. I don't know anything else, though. I didn't know the Word of God. I'd never read the Bible. Maybe that's why my doubt came in so early. But anyway, something's changed. Changed within by God's Holy Spirit. That's what happened to the Gentile, the same as it does a believer today. They were changed within. And then they go, what now? Right? What now do I do? For many today who give their lives to the Lord for the first time, they maybe have never been exposed to the Word of God, never been exposed to a church at all, never exposed at all. They say, same thing. What now? Something's changed. Something's changed in me, but what now? I can recognize it. You know, I literally could, you know, some people say, I literally recognize God's Holy Spirit now living within me. It's changed my, what I speak. You know, first thing God did for me was took my profanity away. I was a profane man, you know, as a carpenter and everything. And it's incredible how he just wiped that out like that. It was, it was the first thing he took away. But I noticed it. I'm going, that ain't me. See, evangelizing. And preaching the gospel, 
Guys, it's very important. Very, very important. Those who go out, in fact, there's a gift of evangelism. Literally go out and go out and preach the gospel and evangelize. But without good instruction, without proper discipleship, the new believer can be left confused. Totally confused. What now? You know, uh, I went out one time with this uh, older gentleman and and we were going to do some uh, evangelizing on downtown square. And I would never mention the name, um, and I won't, but he made it kind of a game. And it's no game. He made it kind of a game. Well, let's see how many we can see get to uh, profess Christ tonight. And then he'd hand them some little piece of paper and they'd be gone. I'm thinking, well, what'd you do? What did you do for that person? What if they really profess Christ for the first time? Man, you need to gather them in. You need to get them in a good Bible teaching church. You evangelize that man. Now he's confused. Well, I don't know what I did, you know, but here I am. I personally believe that is the number one job of the church. You wonder what the job of the church is? What the job of this place right here is? It's to teach. It's to disciple, period. Teach and disciple. Train up. And equip, as it says in Ephesians 4.12, for the equipping of the saints. For the equipping of the saints, for the work of the ministry, for the edifying of the body of Christ. You know, some believe the church is more than, more of just a meeting place, right? A meeting place, we come together in fellowship, hang out as believers. Kind of a social club, like you go to the Lions Club or something of that nature. Hey, that's what we just go to church. We go there, and you know what? We have a good time. We kumbaya. We sing songs. We get to raise our hands. We get to hear somebody give a nice little sermon and maybe have a potluck afterwards. No, the church is all about teaching, teaching and discipling. If you bring somebody to the Lord, you get the opportunity to share Christ with somebody. Make sure you bring them. Take them someplace. If you're in another town, go find a good church. I found a good church for dear brother in the Lord from Will Hoyt here down in Phoenix. What I did, I got online. I found out where he lived. I got online and I listened to some teachings from that pastor, man. I made sure he was going to sit under some good teaching. It wasn't, it wasn't the building. It wasn't the people. It was what that teaching was going to be. Like I say, some believe, uh, some believe the church is just a building. By the way, the church is you. I want you to know that. Jesus' church is you, not a building. So Paul took his ministry. See, as he's ministering to these, these Gentiles, he took it into the very homes of the Gentiles, teaching them there. Well, they didn't have buildings, right? Well, they had homes, but they didn't have like a gathering place. We didn't construct churches till later on. He went right into their homes. In verse 16, it says, that I might be a minister of Jesus Christ to the Gentiles, ministering the gospel of God, that the offering now of the Gentiles might be acceptable and sanctified by the Holy Spirit. He took it right into their homes. He was a minister for Jesus Christ. Guys, if you take that in original translation, it literally means uh, like an Old Testament priest. He taught them the sacrifice, not the sacrifice of animals, the sacrifice of their hearts. That's what he was teaching. But he was literally like an Old Testament priest. We would see reference in Old Testament. Like I say, sacrificing, the sacrificing of their hearts. In Psalm 51, this is what God wants. This is what he wants from his children. For you do not desire sacrifices or else I'd give it. You do not delight in burnt offerings. The sacrifices of God are a broken spirit, a broken and contrite heart. These, O oh God, you will not despise. Church, God wants your heart. He always has. He's always wanted the heart of man. And Paul was teaching them, those Gentiles, how to give them your heart. Guys, I want you to point out something here. Did you notice in verse uh, 16 how Paul spoke of all three of the Godhead 
in that one verse. You see that? That I might be a minister of Jesus Christ, the Son of God, to the Gentiles, ministering the gospel of God, the Father, that the offering of the Gentiles might be acceptable and sanctified by the Holy Spirit. Each one with their own position. Now, some people struggle with this triune God, right? I don't. Well, I can receive that one by faith with all the things God's done in my life. I got no problem with the triune God. They all have their own position. God bringing the gospel. Wait a minute, God bringing the gospel? I thought that was Jesus. Well, who put Jesus here? God gave us Jesus as that gospel. Literally, God the Father. Jesus, then as our high priest, as it says in Hebrews, right? Making intercession for us. Making that intercession. Then the Holy Spirit, he put that in there too. As the one who literally sanctifies us before God. You understand that? When, when God's Holy Spirit comes into you, when you become a believer for the first time, you are now sanctified before God. You are... You are <coughs> You are cleansed. You are righteous. Righteous. And so you've never done anything wrong. You're justified. Verse 17, we'll move on. Therefore, it says, Therefore, I have reason to glory in Christ Jesus in things which pertain to God. I love Paul said that I got, I have, I have reason to glory in Jesus Christ in the things which pertain to God. For I will not dare to speak of those things which Christ has not accomplished through me in word or in deed to make the Gentiles obedient in mighty signs and wonders by the power of the Holy Spirit by the power of the Spirit of God. So from Jerusalem and round about to Illyricum, I have preached now. I have fully preached, he says. I have fully preached the gospel of Christ. Mm. <clears throat> See, Paul's ministry to the Gentile nation was all due to what God had done. We understand? It was all the, what he'd done. All the glory Paul gives to God. I mentioned this since last Sunday, the Sunday before. He, you know, the fact is, when anything we do, we give God the glory. We praise Jesus for it. Paul was only praising Jesus for what Jesus had done through him. If you do a work for the Lord and you get some accolades, always say, praise my Lord. He used me. That's all he did, Right? He just used me for that. Hmm. He never wanted any of the credit for himself. He never wanted the credit for what Jesus had done. You know, in verse 18, it says there, For I will not dare to speak of any of those things which Christ has not accomplished through me in word and deed to make the Gentiles obedient. I personally believe this should be the heart of every servant church. I think it should be the heart of anyone who calls himself a Christian. Speak only of what Jesus has accomplished through you. What he's accomplished through us, right? You know, it can be really easy to take the credit for what Jesus did. <laughs> yeah, that was me. Sure enough. That was me. I did that. Can be real easy to take that credit. Man, somebody will look at you and go, Wow, wow, you did, you did a wonderful work for the Lord. Yeah, I know. I know. Wasn't that good? <laughs> no. Give God the credit. Jesus, Jesus will use you. God will use you if you allow Him. But you're not going to take the credit. Amen? It's never us. It's never us, really. It's Jesus who lives in us. It all belongs to Him. Everything. God gives us our ability. And Paul knew this truth. You guys remember what he says in Galatians 2.20? It was Christ. I have been crucified with Christ. It is no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me. It's Jesus doing the work. And the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. It's not us. Not us at all. Could you close that door, please, Tony? When we give God the glory, church, when you give God the glory, 
like I say, give it all to Jesus. When you give it there, then you become, what the Bible says, as a useful vessel for his work. Now, what do you mean by that? I'm going to show you in a minute. When you give Christ the glory, you become a useful vessel. I got a quote here from Warren Wiersbe. We're going to put it up on the screen. And I've always loved this quote. It says, ministry takes place when divine resources meet human needs through loving channels to the glory of God. Ministry takes place. Those things of God takes place when the divine resources, where are the divine resources? That's from God. It all comes from God, those divine resources. And they meet those needs in humanity by those loving channels. Who's the loving channel? That's you. That's the Christian. To the glory of God, though. Not to the glory of the Christian, the loving channel, to the glory of God. The question is, do we desire to be useful vessels or just vessels now? How to be that useful vessel? We're going to go there. Go to 2 Timothy, please, with me. 2 Timothy, chapter 2. Paul writes to Timothy, and guys, don't take this wrong, but he talks about those vessels of honor and those vessels of dishonor. And by the way, they're all in the same house. So when we read house, understand, that's the church. There's vessels of honor and vessels of dishonor. We're going to talk about that. What kind of vessel do you want to be? 2 Timothy 2.20. <clears throat> Paul says, But in a great house, we'll say the church, there are not only vessels of gold and silver, but also of wood and clay, some for honor and some for dishonor. Well, we can understand gold vessels, you know, those are, those are for the nice dinner wear. We just use the clay ones when we haven't, the average person over, honor and dishonor. Therefore, it says, therefore, now therefore means what we just read. Therefore, if anyone cleanses himself from the latter, that dishonor, if you cleanse yourself from the latter, he will be a vessel for honor, sanctified and useful to masters, for the master, prepared for every good work. Hmm. Which are we? Which are you? Are you, the, are you that vessel that's being used by God? Or are you that vessel just part of the house? You know, a buddy of mine would say, are you, that, are you that Christian being used by God, serving God? And I don't mean necessarily right here in the church. I mean in other areas too. Are you that Christian serving God? Or are you a pew potato? You know, I just come here and sit. And this is what I do. That makes that vessel of honor. Or... That vessel of dishonor. That vessel of honor is useful, it says. Useful to the master. The only difference between the two vessels, by the way, is, is our heart of being sanctified, set apart for the master's use, right? It says, it says there, therefore, if anyone cleanses himself from the latter, he will be a vessel of honor. Sanctified, which means set apart, and now you're useful for the master. Useful for him. That's the only thing that makes a difference. You're wanting to be used? Well, you can ask yourself that question. Do I want to be a vessel of honor? Do I want to be used by God? Do I want to serve God? Or are you just happy in that you're in the house at all? I mean, be honest with you. When I first became a Christian, I was just happy I was in the house at all, man. Seriously, guys, don't look so glum. It's okay. I know most of you guys are useful vessels. I might be preaching to the choir here, amen? <laughs> uh, let God use you guys. Set your life apart. Be used by God. Guys, there's no greater ride, I'm telling you. No greater ride. I told, used to tell these kids at juvenile detention, these teenagers that go and minister, I said, you want, a, you want an incredible high of high? I come from that era, man. I came from a lot of drugs. I come from a lot of being high. There was no high like being with Jesus, man. Jesus has taken me incredible places. And I'd tell them, I said, you want to ride? Grab on to Jesus. 
<laughs> He'll take you on one incredible ride. Verse 19, it says, uh, in mighty signs and wonders, by the power of, of the Spirit of God, so that from Jerusalem and around about Illyricum, I have fully preached the gospel of Christ, he says. Paul speaks of mighty signs and wonders that have taken place during his ministry. Guys, there were. We went through the book of Acts. Those mighty signs and wonders. And he's basically saying from Jerusalem, Jerusalem to Illyricum, that's from east to west. As far as we know, the world is this. From east to west, these things have taken place and I've preached it fully. Healings. Think about those healings that happened in the book of Acts. Man, there was a lot. A lot of salvation. That's a miracle. That's a sign. Jail breaks. They had some incredible jail breaks there. You know, let them right out of there. The Holy Spirit opened up. Uh, those uh, those um, jailers actually being blinded, not seeing them even go by them, right? Incredible things. How? By the Spirit of God. That's what Paul says. All by the Spirit of God. And I could tell you, I could tell you, I don't think I have time this morning. I could tell you story after story attesting to the power of God's Spirit. You know, before, before uh, I was a pastor, I was, well, I'll use the word, mission junkie. I was a mission junkie. I went on short-term missions all over this world, guys, three times in Nairobi, Kenya, the Philippines, uh, Honduras, Iraq, Turkey. I was a mission junkie. Every time I got out there, man, I was just like, boom. You know, that was, that was my high, seriously. It replaced, it replaced the meth and the cocaine and everything. Serving my Lord out there. Doing God's work. Watching His Spirit work. Physical healings. Literally praying on somebody. Physically healed right there. Spiritual healings. Removing of demons. You want to call it an exorcism? That's exactly what it was. As the Bible says, we, fight against, we don't fight against flesh and blood. Principalities and powers. We literally prayed over people where demons came out of them. By the way, none in the United States. Over in Kenya, down in Mexico one time. I don't know why. Maybe we hide it better, you know? Those type of things. Physical healings. Border guards being blinded. Traveling from Turkey to Iraq on foot across the border because nobody could seem to drive us across there. Nobody had the right thing. Taking stuff we oughtn't take. And I'm not talking drugs, okay? I'm talking Bibles and things of that nature. Boom. They don't even see it. All by the Spirit of God. Really no other explanation. Paul says he fully preached the gospel of Christ. <clears throat> I'm going to wind it down with this. Sometimes I think, I think, that's where, I think that's where the church fails today. Fully preaching the gospel of Christ, church. They want to preach about a lot of other things. They want to tell you a lot of other things, but they don't want to preach the gospel of Christ. And not fully preaching it. God help me if I don't fully preach the gospel of Christ. God help me. That's what he's called me to. Preaching the gospel. The power. And to fully preach it too. The power of God's gospel. Romans 1.16, Paul said, For I am not ashamed. By the way, I take this one for myself. And I hope you take it for you too. I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God to salvation. You understand, without the gospel, there is no power into salvation. If we want to talk about, I don't know, some other thing, there's no power of salvation in there. You need the gospel. Less of man's words. More of God's words. Less of eloquent sermons. You notice, Calvary Chapel, we teach line by line, verse by verse, straight through the Word of God. Why? You guys will receive 100% of the counsel of God's Word. And it doesn't matter what the pastor wants to preach on, what he wants to teach on, because when I get there, I'm sorry, have to. And if it nails you, I'm sorry. But it's God's Word that nailed you, right? That's why we teach that way, line by line, verse by verse. Hopefully by the first of the year, we'll be through the book of Romans. Amen? We'll be moving somewhere else. Uh, fully preach it. Verse 20, 21. 
We've got to wind it down here. I told you, though, we got lunch ready. And so I have made it my aim to preach the gospel. He made it his aim, not where Christ was named, lest I should build on another man's foundation. But as it is written, to whom he was not announced, they shall see. And those who have not heard shall understand. Mm. Not only do we need the gospel preached, we need it preached in more places. You see, that's what Paul was doing, going to more places. Paul's desire and commission by God was to reach out to all that had not heard the gospel. Paul was a missionary. That's basically, he went on these missionary journeys, going to places that needed the saving gospel. Guys, there is nothing wrong with planning a church in a community where another church is, okay? But seriously, <laughs> how many churches are there in Prescott? How many churches are there in Prescott Valley? How many churches are there in Chino Valley? How many? Well, let's go plant one here. There's nothing wrong with planting them where they're at. But what about, how about the areas of less importance? Well, what is that? What do you mean less importance? Well, I'm talking about places they need the gospel. How about those areas like, how about like Aguila down there? A little community of farmers and a lot of Hispanics there. How about planting a church there? I'm sure there's a church there, but you know what? You could plant another church there. How about Salome or Wendon, those areas? How about up in Paulden? That's quite a community out there. There is one church I know of, and I think there might be a second one. Boy, you could plant a church out in Paulden. Why not there? Whitman. I always hear about Whitman. It's always burning for some reason, you know? But anyway, I I've never been to Whitman, but how about in Whitman? How about in Wilhoyt? Amen? I am so thankful God brought me here, my wife and I down here, to plant a church. Amen? How about those less important places like Wilhoyt? I'm not saying you guys ain't important. Trust me, man. I love you. Too many men plant churches where the demographics of the community rule their decision. You understand that? How am I going to build that church? How am I going to... Make that church really financially successful. Where does that ever come into preaching the gospel? Whether it's financially, you know, successful. By the way, God takes very good care of this church right here. Very good, good. We help a lot of people through Calvary Chapel here. And want to plant a church, Paul says, I'll go where they need me. Right? I'll go where they need me. I'll go where they have not heard of Jesus. I'm going to go there. I'm going to head out there. Now, everybody, I would say, in the United States has heard the name Jesus, but they don't know Jesus, church. You understand? They don't know the true Jesus, the gospel. I'll go where those hearts need Jesus. That's what Paul said. I'll go to those lost that need that salvation. Amen? You know, I got a question here. Are you here this morning as one of those that Paul would have reached out to? One of those that need that salvation? One of those that his gospel message would have been going to out in that little community? One needing that saving gospel. Are you here this morning? One in need of a new life, maybe in Christ. Well, I have good news. That gospel of salvation has come to Wilhoit. It's come right before you. I want to give you opportunity now to receive Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior. If you'd bow your head and close your eyes. If you want to receive Jesus this morning, trust me, it would be the best thing you ever did. <laughs> Just pray along this line. Pray in your heart and your mind. Say, Jesus, I come to you this morning. I want to receive you. I want to receive your Holy Spirit. I want to receive the promises you have for me, God. Lord Jesus, I confess to you I am a sinner in need of a Savior. And Lord, I come before you now and I ask that you receive me, Lord, that I may receive you. I know you died upon the cross. I know that you, you gave your life for me, God. I confess my sins before you. I, this day, I want to be a Christian. I give my life to you. I receive you as my Lord and Savior. In Jesus' name, amen. If you said that prayer after, uh, after this last song, 
I want you to come forward. There'll be some people up here to pray with you. Come forward and just say, hey, I just, I just received my Lord for the first time. And trust me, we'll get you discipled. Amen? Guys, let's worship.